Bonsoir à toutes et à tous. It was It was yep. Dear students, dear colleagues, uh, we, we're about to start. It's exactly 5.30. It's very rare at Sciences Po that we start right on, you know, at the exact time a conference. Um, so we are going to conduct this conference in English. But as you know, Sciences Po is a bilingual school. We emphasize very much on French and English. For, so for the Anglophone, you can try to raise your hand in French. I'm thinking of some of my students that I can see here. Uh, and for the Francophone one, you could you know, challenge yourself by raising a question in English. Just to say that you feel free to use whatever you, language you feel comfortable with. Okay? The important is to have the, the chance to um, uh, communicate and dialogue with our guest. So, without further ado, um, I'm, my, my, I'm just going to tell you that my name is Stéphanie Balm. I'm the director uh, of CERI, which is the Center of International Studies at Sciences Po. And I happen also to be a professor at PSIA, your school, for, for most of you. And you'll be happy to know that we are starting a new series of conferences which are co-organized between CERI and PSIA. So PSIA, which is a training school, and CERI, which is the place where we do fundamental research in international relations at Sciences Po. And so we're very happy to uh, today have the chance to welcome Dr. Hisham Alawi. Um, and uh, we're very, very privileged to um, uh, welcome him uh, tonight and very happy to welcome him at a moment when we start to launch the CERI PSIA conferences. Um, I would like to tell you... Um, a few words um, about our guest, and, and I mean a few because it will take about the time of the conference uh, to explain in details what has been his academic career, his political career, uh, his career as a humanist, I would say, a humanist. Uh, but at least let me tell you um, that um, our guest is a political scientist by training. He's been working extensively those last years on political economy and international political economy. Um, um, on, and, and, and has, has been graduated from the, the best Ivy League university in America, uh, all of them most, mostly. He's currently um, uh, teaching uh, at UC Berkeley, a, a university that we know very well because we have a double degree between Sciences Po and, and Berkeley. Um, also, he's been the director and founder of um, a foundation uh, named after him, whose goal is important because the goal is really to um, take very seriously social sciences, political science, economy, philosophy, in order to better understand the research, the, the regions which are um, going through economic development, in particular in the Middle East and in the northern part of Africa. So uh, this foundation, which helps very much keeping a vivid political debate, in particular in Morocco, is very dear to us because it really places social sciences in the heart of political debates. It's all the question about fundamental research and policymaking. How policymaking can be better conduct if it's based on evidence, on facts, and also if it's based on innovation. And you know innovation is not only about tech, it's also about social sciences. So how to train in the best way the young generations uh, to, so to let them uh, you know, uh, think in a new way, uh, in which way they can develop the region where they come from. So I really hope, and we've discussed with Stéphane Lacroix, who, who is your professor for some of you, we've discussed of the possibility of extending this relation between CERI and this foundation. Um, so um, one probably last word that I would like to men mention, um, you, the, the, the conference tonight is very much about political economy and about models, and you'll be quite inspired to listen very carefully. As myself, I'm a, Chinese, I'm a China expert, and the Chinese model has influenced very much the Gulf model, that you are, that which is looked in a very critical way uh, by our guest. And I think it's very interesting to see the cross experiences of all these models to really understand some of the economies of the global south. 
Um, I would like to thank Stéphane Lacroix to give us this opportunity. I would like to thank also Ishak Diwan to be here tonight and to do the commentaries after the conference. Um, without further ado, either Stéphane or do you want to say? Yes, I, I let you speak. Thank you very much, uh, Stéphanie, and uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to all of you. It's good to see a, a room full of, uh, full of people uh, to attend this, this important conference. Um, and yes, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm glad Stéphanie did already speak quite a bit about our guest uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Isham Alawi, um, and a lot has been said. What I could, what I could add is that he is uh, both, and that's why we're inviting him, both a brilliant scholar who has uh, worked on these issues of first democratization and the rule of law, and then gradually political economy has become the main focus of his last works. So um, he is an author who has published a number of, a number of important books. Um, one uh, that was published a few years ago was on pacted democracy in the Middle East. Um, so that was a book that engaged with the theories of democratization in the context of the uh, political transitions that followed the Arab Spring, and it was a comparison between Egypt and Tunisia. He's then looked at uh, the um, political economy of Arab education, and uh, at the same time, he published a book on security assistance in the Middle East, together with, a, with another scholar. So he's been looking at all these different issues, but again, the question of political economy has become uh, more and more central to his recent works, and, and that's the current research he's conducting. Of course, um, Dr. Isham Alawi is uh, a scholar, but he's also an insider, right? And that's also uh, what um, um, makes him very precious to listen to, because he's also a voice for reform in the Arab world. He's been one very prominent uh, proponent of reform and democracy in the Arab world over the last uh, few decades. Um, he uh, has a very interesting political trajectory uh, which some of you might be interested in and which he recounted in the book uh, that he's his personal memoir uh, that was published in French. Was it translated into English? No, in Arabic and, uh, and in Arabic, Arabic and, and French. And Arabic and Spanish too. Spanish called Journal d'un Prince Banni. If you want to have a look at that book, then you'll probably know more about his political trajectory as someone who, again, came from within the uh, system of Moroccan politics and then uh, gradually emancipated himself from that structure to become an independent uh, mind pushing for uh, reform and change uh, throughout the region. Um, so again, that's, that's, uh, that, that, that's, many, that's one of the many, many reasons why we're very uh, honored to receive him uh, today with us. Um, he, as I said, has been gradually uh, working on political economy that's become the main topic of his research. And in a sense, he, I mean, he's a political scientist by training, and he uh, looks at political economy by re-emphasizing the political in political economy, right? There's been a tendency in political economy to over-economicize political economy as if you know, economic issues were just technical issues that were uh, separated from politics. Again, what we're going to see tonight with Isham Alawi is an attempt to re-emphasize uh, the political in political economy, that is, to look at the impact on political decision-making on economic development or lack thereof. And, um, and so to look at how political decisions have, um, and political structures have hindered uh, uh, economic development in the Arab world and, and, and what could be done to correct that. Uh, those are many of the issues that uh, uh, Dr. Isham Alawi is going to address uh, uh, tonight. And after that, we'll have um, a discussion by uh, Professor Ishaq Diwan, uh, who uh, teaches uh, uh, economy at the um, uh, Paris School of Economy. Uh, he is one of the, again, one of the leading economists of the Arab world. Uh, he has worked for the World Bank on Arab de economic development for many, many years, and in Africa as well, I think you'll been looking at East Africa and the Arab world for many, many years. And, uh, and now you're, again, one of the, the leading voices on, uh, on Arab uh, economies. So this is a discussion, in a sense, between a political scientist and an economist, right? And this is also uh, what we're, you know, this, we're looking for these kind of fruitful exchange between two perspectives on that important issue. Uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Isham Alawi. Um, and so, well. Welcome again, and it's great to have you. Thank you very much for you. Thank
Thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction from Madam Director, for the warm welcome by Madam Nadine, and for your introduction, uh, Stefan, uh, and for the presence of all, and for the organizers. I am very honored to be here. I must apologize. I'm very happy to learn that it, these notes or these uh, research in progress can be delivered in English, but I have to apologize for the fact I looked into the mirror and realized that my hair was out of control. Excuse me, but you know I come to uh, Science Po, as we would say in Berkeley, but with uh, with hair from Berkeley. So please uh, bear with me. Uh, um, yes. So uh, uh, I am looking at uh, political economy in the in, through the lens or through the angle that Stefan uh, Professor Lacroix just articulated, and I'm a scholar of transition to democracy, and given the lull or the pause that there is in democratization, I was uh, too depressed to look at authoritarian regimes, so I decided to see what sustains the status quo until uh, the next uh, revolt or the next uh, breakthrough happens in the region, and hence decided to look at these things. Uh, in addition to being econometric and to being, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Lacroix said, uh, perhaps a bit too technical and technocratic, there is also the tendency to look at, uh, to historicize in the longue durée, as we would say in French, political economy, and hence, as many would dub it, it has become for too long uh, the um, le Marxisme pour bourgeois, as we'd say. Uh, so that these are two views uh, of political economy I, I, I recognize exist out there, but mine uh, is another one. We will go through these, um, these uh, slides. Uh, the first ones will be uh, faster because uh, they synthesize uh, the ills uh, that you know are plaguing the region, and then we will devote more, ti more time to the novel and the more recent research and findings together and uh, hopefully we will have a, a debate about them. I am most privileged to have as their, the respondent, not discussant because he doesn't have a formal paper to, to, to look at and discuss, but the respondent being uh, Professor Ishaq Diwan, who has a, a sharp eye and who has a trenchant analysis and will be able to enrich us with his insights. So as you know, uh, the political sources of political instability in the region are very familiar to all, and they're very familiar certainly to most of you. And they basically can be summarized by this political unrest, as in the Arab Spring, aftershocks uh, cannot be disentangled from the deeper economic problems. Uh, in many states, we know what plagues the region, namely stagnant education, high unemployment, systemic corruption, and so forth. And they all undermine political growth and uh, regretfully uh, nourish political exclusion. Violent conflicts also very important in the region. They also basically destroy the social uh, structure, decimate institutions, and traumatize generation. This is something particular to this region, to this neck of the woods more than anywhere else. Moving on, as I said, a little bit more synthetically in the first sides, uh, we can talk about rethinking the regional political economy. So, in my sense, in my definition, or the definition I choose to retain today, is that uh, political economy refers to how political constraints shape economic possibilities. Uh, authoritarian regimes are perpetually worried about their survival. It is the raison d'etre of any autocracy. Now, it's a raison d'etre also for any elected, uh, any elected government in a consolidated democracy, but it's a little bit different from uh, authoritarian uh, states because authoritarian states and authoritarian incumbents think once they go, they cannot come back or they risk essentially being put on trial and uh, other uh, problems. So rethinking economic reforms brings about the question of political costs, which incentivize autocrats to make unproductive choices. And by unproductive, I just do not mean suboptimal in the econometric sense. Suboptimal can always be upgraded to a little better, a little better, even if they're not optimal. No, I'm talking about sometimes unproductive choices, which sometimes fly in the face of sane and sound economic rationale. And 
uh, this is the most important, of course. Uh, I would, I, this, this is the, 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 the first bullet point that should be on top of them all. They hinder sustainable uh, development. And the key question is here is sustainability. It's not the question if this trick or that trick works, if it delivers. The question is, is it sustainable in the long run? And uh, yes, there are some autocratic regimes that are benign, that uh, seek the benefits of the masses. But their policies, because they are based on survival, pre precisely uh, exclude the masses. And they exclude the masses by benefiting to a small uh, uh, elite. Uh, I will move on here, and I will categorize. It's my categorization. Of course, it's arbitrary and judgmental. Other, other scholars can categorize the region with different categories. Mine basically separates into three tires. The first one is the rich countries of the, uh, of the, of the Gulf, and they're the rentier states. Now, of course, within that, the, the, the first category, you also have the super rentier states that are Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. Then you have the middle income countries which, uh, which have excess labor, and they're Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Morocco, Algeria, Jordan, Tunisia, and Lebanon. I've included Iran, even if it's not formally part of the, of the Arab world, but it's certainly part of the Middle East. And of course, lastly, there are, or at the bottom of uh, the ladder, you have the poorest countries that are racked by conflict. Palestine, Libya, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Whether uh, 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 these countries are poor because they are due to the conflict, whether the conflict comes from first or uh, the fact that they are almost failed states has created conflict is a matter of exploration uh, 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 for other research, but not specifically for this research. As I move on, uh, this is a little bit the spectrum of GDP per capita distributed or uh, uh, aligned with different countries. And as you'll see, you have a country like, uh, like, uh, like Qatar or the UAE, basically, which, uh, which are attaining uh, those countries of OCD basically Eastern, uh, Western Europe and the United States and Canada. And uh, uh, there's a lot of variation, uh, uh, of course. And uh, there is also very poor performance, Libya or Iraq or even Algeria, with the fact that these countries have important uh, hydrocarbon uh, resources and their economies are based on extraction. And precisely, that's... Precisely one of the problems is reliance on extraction. I will go uh, uh, to the common constraints. Now, this is the common story. And this is a very important uh, synopsis of the contradictions and the pulls, the pulls and push uh, these uh, regimes are confronted with. There's mass disenchantment with the Nasserist social contract. And that was uh, uh, the golden goose in the beginning of the 1950s. Everybody wanted to replicate Nasser. And few countries uh, basically delivered on that model, with the exception of uh, the Gulf and Morocco. The Gulf, because it has the means uh, to, uh, to, to furnish subsidies from the cradle to the grave. And Morocco is because it never espoused that, mo that model. But apart from these countries, everybody got more or less stuck in this problematic until uh, the failure of new, and until the 1980s, before the 1990s, the 1980s, we saw uh, the crash of petroleum prices, and that whole model basically uh, disentangled and evaporated. In the 1990s, we have uh, the introduction of some certain uh, neoliberal reforms. Now they are, uh, you know, uh, structural adjustment, as you know, but afterwards, more than macroeconomic uh, stabilization, the more uh, policies pertaining to microeconomics, and uh, they had to do with the so-called neoliberal reforms. Now, what's important to, to realize is that this is a uh, misnomer. This is an abuse of language. This is everything but neoliberal reforms. So they were institution, they were basically uh, 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 centered around import substitution, 
but it is only those that had inside links to the regime that benefited from them. And ultimately, they failed. They failed at a time where uh, 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 consecutively, or I'm sorry, uh, concurrently with the fact that the state had removed many of its subsidies and social nets, and hence created a double crisis. Uh, high unemployment plagues the region. Two thirds of Arabs are under 30 years old, but the private sector job creation lags behind. In Saudi Arabia too, for a, a variety of other reasons. Political pressures to maintain unproductive state policies, such as low taxation, and high military spending, that hinder long-term growth. Low taxation, why? Because uh, uh, people lose that confidence in the government and prefer going economically underground and staying in the gray zone. And the government, too, does not want uh, to bring up uh, that whole strata of economic development into the formal sector because at the end it means taxation. And you know the saying, taxation, with taxation comes the demand for representation. Uh, then you have, of course, fierce competition in mature global uh, economy that penalizes the latecomers. A lot, a lot of countries are latecomers. There are even late latecomers into uh, uh, the uh, intensely labor uh, uh, markets. So the little, the little, uh, the little uh, section here on Saudi, on Saudi Arabia really explains in a nutshell, with four statistics, the real problem, why it's crunch time in these countries and especially Saudi Arabia. So 65% of the population is under 30. Imagine that. 65% of the population, that is every or most of you in this room would belong to that segment of 65%. 63% of the population under 30 are unemployed. So it means that almost an overlap, everybody in that segment is, uh, uh, is, uh, is unemployed or in the very least underemployed. 400,000 is the number of jobs that Saudi Arabia needs to create each year. 58% of the population under 30 have degrees. So half of that reservoir are people that have degrees and that feel that they are entitled to have a job, it's their right not only a human rights, but also a right because of the degree of proficiency they have and of the degree of academic competence they have. So imagine the pressure any regime would be under in those circumstances. This is uh, the intersection of political constraints and economic threats. So the problem comes with food security, and this has been exacerbated it has started to appear with COVID, the rupture of the, uh, of the uh, supply chains, and it has really come full-blown with the war in Ukraine, or shall I say, the special operation in Ukraine. It's not a war, it's a special interpretation. And, uh, 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 and you see the, 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 the countries in blue are in countries that basically have a problem. People need to feed themselves. And, and there's a shortage of grain. And when you look at it closer, you look at it closer, you say, well, Lord and behold, this doesn't come out of a vacuum. This is, again, an economic choice, not having invested in self-sufficiency uh, uh, in grain. This is, again, a choice for political survival. Why? Because all these regimes are in blue, basically followed the model of Nasser and it was industrialized. We cannot stay agrarian because agrarian means we are underdeveloped, but if we are industrialized, that means we have propaganda. We are advanced. We are advancing and we are en route to becoming like the West. And everybody, of course, was linked to the unique or to the dominant party, and as such, Everybody, in a, in a certain way, had that linkage, and everybody, in a way, was guaranteed a subsidy, and hence was guaranteed food subsidy. And when you look at this graph, the only one that is, uh, I wouldn't say not vulnerable, but less exposed, is Morocco. And you say to yourself, why, why, what's so different about Morocco? Well, again, the decision about Morocco 
is politically motivated, it is again has to do with survival of the regime. If you all here are, some of you are interested in the Middle East and North Africa, read a book, a seminal book by Rémi Levou, I think it was called uh, Le Fallah Marocain, Supporter du Trône. It meant that the Moroccan throne or the Moroccan monarchy was supported by the Fallah. And as such, the Moroccan regime, or King Hassan more specifically, made that deliberate decision to not neglect agriculture. It turns out to have been a wise decision. But it's one decision out of many. Usually, uh, 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 authoritarian regimes you know, get it wrong. But this one, it was the luck of the draw. Or maybe vision, who knows? It's about historians. Historians will debate that. Now, on that, we move to uh, the Gulf model. And of course, there was a Gulf model since, but this is a relatively, I'm talking about the new iteration of the Gulf model, the new model. This is a new model that came up you know, in the, at the turn of the century. And before I go into these bullet points, let me just say what are the three uh, conditions that basically uh, helped or that uh, triggered uh, the, the bringing about of this new model. And the first, I would say, is a succession in these uh, Middle East, uh, in these Gulf states. And around the 2000, year 2000, beginning of that turn of the century, you had a series of succession in Abu Dhabi, in Bahrain, in, uh, in, 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 the United Arab, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, we talked about it, uh, but also in Saudi Arabia and uh, in Qatar. New leaders who saw that, you know, at the end of the day, they wanted to base their legacy and their leadership on other modes of governance. The second backdrop condition, or the second factor, was uh, the US withdrawal from the region. The US declared withdrawn from the region. Now, the US did not, did not withdraw or retreat from this, uh, this region based on philanthropy, no. It had enough uh, other faucets and other pipelines through which oil would flow in the, in the world and it had access to that oil. It didn't need the Middle East in the, same, in the same way. And besides, it looked at China as being the new source of the new challenge and as such wanted to stay relevant as the only hegemon or the, or the premier power on the stage. This is why it withdrew. For these leaders in the region, America coming to defend them in the case of another adventure like uh, the Kuwaiti, the, the, Iraq, the Iraq's invasion in Kuwait was becoming hypothetical. And hence, they had to step up to the plate and create a new model. Lastly, and it also, these come at the same time was the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring explodes onto the scene on 2011. At the same time, all these factors come together and the UAE and Saudi Arabia because they, they see uh, the possible democratization as a threat to their regimes, and they're thinking strategically, not normatively, it's realpolitik, as one would say in the field, decided to placate these democratic forces everywhere in the region. And as such, all these factors pushed them to become, or to think about new regimes that would project their power onto the region onto the region and onto the world stage. And this was economically and politically. Now, the globalized national economies in selective and capital intensive sectors like the finance and logistics, all these countries, Abu Dhabi, Riyadh, and, uh, and Doha sought to be economic hubs uh, uh, in the world. And uh, in fact, they did everything also uh, to join BRICS and other organizations above and beyond uh, the usual uh, uh, perimeter or area of uh, deployment, which was then uh, the Arab world. And uh, they also realized, and that comes with their new thinking, as they're all uh, astute and well-versed into the imperatives of the new world, they realize that uh, oil and hydrocarbons are a, a diminishing commodity. And as such, they had to prepare for a world uh, beyond oil. Uh, commercial mega project that transform urban centers and reconfigure public life. 
if you go into Doha or uh, or uh, or Abu Dhabi, you realize clearly that you are in some something that's starting to look like Singapore, and in certain places even like Hong Kong. And so this is this is the drive to replicate and to compete with uh, other thriving places. Now, cultural investments into social leisure, such as sports, music, and art, and luxury. And this flows directly from uh, the diversific diversification of uh, away from oil. Because you're diversifying away from oil, you need to rationalize your econo economy. And as such, the subsidies are not the same anymore. And because the subsidies are uh, uh, decreasing, you have to offer your people a new social contract. And the new social contract is consumption and leisure. You have to be able to walk into these places and you think like you're in Paris or somewhere else. It is thought or the rationale being that this will uh, essentially uh, help facilitate the acceptance of this model. Now, how am I doing time-wise, Professor Lacroix? I'm okay? Thank you, sir. 10 minutes more, at least, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, boy. Uh, you'll give me 15, please. Okay. With your permission, thank you. We'll give you 15. Okay, thank you. So uh, the Gulf model, uh, uh, as the slide says, the Gulf model cannot be exported to, rest, to the rest of MIDA for the simple reason, because of the, uh, hydrocarbon, uh, the hydrocarbon factor. It is simply uh, uh, something specific to the region uh, sui generis that cannot be uh, uh, pushed elsewhere. Now, uh, a political paradox, most, govern most Gulf governments portray themselves as benign modernizers, but they also exclude masses from political participation. That's the most striking thing in these countries, is the incongruence between economic development and political participation. Uh, it, 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 it existed elsewhere, of course, but to a lesser degree. That gap is wider here. And Gulf capitalist economic strategies are in reality based upon varying degrees of state control rather than pure market competition. When you look closer at this model, you see that this transition into a post-oil or into a new Gulf system has paradoxically, while it has sought to empower the private sector more, on the contrary, it has driven out uh, the public sector, or rather, it has given extremely importance to the to the presence of the state in this project. And uh, Naom is the uh, Naom is the quintessential example of this. Let me move on. Now, internal and external contradictions uh, with this model. The UAE is still in the process of national homogenization. At present, it remains largely centered upon partnership between Sparta, which is Abu Dhabi, and the Venice, which is Dubai. Now, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed is the flag bearer of this new generation and uh, of, this new, of this new Gulf model because he has come to power earlier than, than the other or before the other powers. And he has had the vision, or if you are a Democrat here and you don't agree with that, with that term, you can say the clairvoyance or the political lucidity of seeing that there's a new game in town. And the new game in town is basically you have to be on the move. You cannot only placate the Arab Spring and democratic forces without offering something new. You have to offer an alternative. And that alternative was basically projecting an image or a model of power elsewhere. And we see, hence, the, the, the attempts at intervening or weighing in the outcomes of a country like Libya and a country like Yemen, whether the, it has worked or it has not worked is a matter of debate anyways. I think they have not worked, but at a minimum level, they have, in fact, derailed uh, uh, certain political projects that were underway. Uh, second on board to join this is, of course, Mohammed bin Salman with his project on Neom. Now, Mohammed bin Salman or the Saudi gamble, will citizens in a large post-frontier society accept the logic of the market in return for social pleasures but no democracy? Mohammed bin Salman has a bigger problem than Abu Dhabi 
because Mohammed bin Salman has demographics working against him, which is not the case of Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi will have high expenditures and huge demands on, on, on it, but the, the, it dwarfs anything Saudi Arabia will know. Saudi Arabia will know a lot of pressure. And hence, the project of Mohammed, Salman, Mohammed bin Salman is in a hurry. He is a man in a hurry. And the projects or his vision can be best encapsulated with the project of Neom. Neom is something, is a city that resembles space or whatever, and it's going to basically be a new economy in which everything will be done differently. And this is the gambit of political, uh, you will have renewable energy there, you will have uh, futuristic projects, uh, uh, industrial stuff which is different. When you look at it, it's very hard to see what can actually work in the case of uh, Saudi Arabia, except maybe for uh, renewable energies or, I'm not a specialist, but other, other type of industries at work. But the point is, Mohammed bin Salman, with his hurry, he feels, feels or has uh, committed a deliberate effort to dissociate himself, to shun the existing bureaucracy of Saudi Arabia. And this is why he had to move Neom outside. He had to create a new space, a new polity, a new, uh, a new city. It's basically divorcing himself spatially, geographically, and sociologically from the old Saudi Arabia because the old Saudi Arabia, and especially the old bureaucracy, continues, constitutes vestiges of obstruction. And so the Abu Dhabi model and the Saudi Arabian model are very different. Uh, of course, we could add in another model here, and that's the model of Qatar. Now, Qatar has decided basically uh, to play the mediator for the region and hence to be more inclusive with everyone and to play the role of mediator. And you see to play a role more akin with the old model, more congruent with the old model, that of uh, immersing with the old structures of solidarity, meaning the Arab world and the Islamic world. And hence, it has kept a lot of that national discourse, uh, that discourse, not just a language of politics, but a discourse of legitimation. And the question is, it has extracted a lot of soft power. The, 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 the challenge for uh, Sheikh Tamim is how to convert that soft power into, into assets. Soft power is always sexier, but it's difficult. It's more difficult to convert that in front of hard power or sharp power. The Abu Dhabi model is based on both hard power when you see interventions in the regions and sharp power too. So uh, 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 economic development at home enables aggressive uh, intervention policies abroad that can aggravate crisis. Actually, you don't know which has come first. I don't think one has accentuated. Rather, they come together because they're part, they're the other side of the corn. They come together because, as I said, as I said they tend to legitimize the political order. Uh, economic challenges uh, in other MENA states. I'll go again through, fast through this. Most MENA economies outside the Gulf face three convergent problems. High unemployment due to weak private sector, chronic debt due to overspending which aggravate dependency upon foreign and multilateral bailouts, and low capacity of state institutions which struggle to enforce rule of law and provide goods and services. That's the problem. Now, then we come to their new strategy, and that is uh, economic segregation, or what I call, prefer to call economic dualism. Most uh, non-Gulf regimes oversee segregated economies. And the choice of segregation is not, is not fortuitous for them. Uh, clearly, the new neoliberal policies have not worked. So the idea here is to make them work for a smaller portion of the population with the hopes that that segment of the population will lift the rest of society into development and prosperity. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a different logic. It's not just, you know, we're, these are the people we like, these are the people we dislike, we don't care about them. No. We're going to see the people that are most endowed with 
uh, uh, the attributes and the qualifications to succeed, we're going to help them with the hopes that they become the levers or the fulcrums around which the rest of society is lifted. And uh, these are essentially then you have a bifurcation between the wealthy and educated elite and the masses where the poor and middle class households struggle to survive in an era of fiscal authority. And the ambitious scheme, like Egypt's new capital city, claims to upgrade the economy. Now, uh, Sisi has another neom. It's not neom, it's different. It's basically a new Cairo. And here the logic with Sisi is very, very different than from Hamid. It's, people think it's similar, but it's not. While Mohammed bin Salman shuns uh, the old bureaucracy, uh, uh, Sisi really fights the new bureaucracy. His line, or his uh, notion, is that Egyptians are either minor, they don't know what's good for them, or they're lethargic, and in which case, uh, uh, he's got to crack the whip so that development happens. And this development is based not so much on a futuristic project, it's based on a modern product, but it's based on a project that seeks its legitimacy in a putative past. We're going to look at the pharaohs. We're, we're going to rejoin and reclaim our place from the time of the pharaohs. And Sisi thinks of himself anything but a, everything like a pharaoh. He never says it, but he's a pharaoh with huge intonations uh, using uh, uh, or, into, or the use, uh, uh, sometimes agile, sometimes awkward, of Islamic discourse for uh, legitimation. And this is, uh, is, very, uh, is very different. Now, one of the effects of this was it is, not, uh, 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 it, it is not being dubious towards the bureaucracy. It is being, frankly, outright suspicious of the bureaucracy. And as hence, he has relied essentially on the military that have occupied, basically, that have replaced the, the bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy is out, and the military are having more and more say in the economy while they do not have the expertise to do it. The result will be, it, it will hurt. How long will that happen? Nobody knows. But at the, at the end of the day, this is a model that will unravel. Mohammed bin Salman's model is a gambit. This is a delusional risky business. Uh, 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 we move on uh, to the barriers to growth in dualistic economies. Despite the abundance of human capital, these schemes, uh, these skills fail to ignite sustainable growth. You give me five minutes, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, these economic, uh, I don't want him to treat me like CC and huh? throw me in jail. So, uh, these economic schemes fail to ignite sustainable growth due to widespread economic informality, due to weak rule of law, inconsistent property rights. That's, a, that's the usual story everywhere. Low trust in government, reflecting the effects of political repression and systemic corruption. A weak private sector, as I said, the military have basically suffocated everyone else and have taken the center stage. Reliance on low productivity interests like tourism and construction. And here's something uh, I, I would like to seek uh, Professor Diwan's uh, view on it. Looking around and looking at these models carefully, I have come to think and I've come to believe that economic industry and even tourism is really uh, like hydrocarbons, it's a rent. And it's a rent that will, that will give disservice to a country more than uh, help it uh, take off. Uh, uh, because uh, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't have the feeling or I have the conviction that uh, revenue from tourism doesn't uh, find its way uh, laterally into the rest of the system. And sometimes I see it as producing the same ills as um, as uh, uh, hydrocarbon extraction, right? it can it can fill in the the the, co the coffers, but beyond that, I, I think it thwarts real ingenuity and real enterprise. But uh, Professor Diwan will tell us more about it. Now, Morocco 
has experienced some success, again, I say relative success, but the old social contract between society and traditional political institutions uh, obstructs the potential for economic creativity and in, in to innovative entrepreneurship. Now, not because it's my country, but Morocco is a bright spot. But it's a bright spot in this area, but that doesn't mean that it has the potential to break the impasse and to tackle the problematic we're talking about. In fact, if anything, I think uh, even if there are progress, that problematic will not be resolved. It will still be there. That's my, my problem. That's my, my conviction. Now, when you look at Morocco, you'll, you'll find that there are uh, pockets of excellence, whether in renewable energies, whether in uh, in uh, telecommunications, or in uh, in even aerospace uh, engineering or assembly, uh, but I doubt, with the same social contract, that these pockets uh, expand and become really uh, levers of development. Uh, the fundamental problem remains the same, and that is the view that uh, economic uh, success on a mass scale is equivalent to dis dissidence and it's threatening uh, to the regime. And as such, I will echo. There's another, also another thinking that another uh, idea which Morocco has been working with. Recognizing the problem, the lack of social nets everywhere and introducing legislation to create social nets that will bring everybody up into the formal sector and as such infuse the system uh, create this as an engine for productivity. Uh, the problem with this is again the same. Uh, when you have a, a, a deficient or weak uh, uh, rule of law, uh, you have problems of, uh, of, of, of property taxes, you have a problem uh, that comes about management, all sorts of problems we're talking about. So I think the Moroccan case is has some positive aspects, but it doesn't have the potential to break that impasse. So it, that means you can always improve, but as you improve, your problems get worse too. You have more inequalities, and you have more people in that bind. And as uh, and a, a, a researcher in Morocco called it, by the name of uh, Najib Aksbi, he called uh, the Moroccan case as you have a glass ceiling. And I feel it's really very well exemplifies that example because you have a glass ceiling for people and a glass ceiling for the government itself. It's keep running after a, a, a goal which is elusive. Now, beyond these paradigms, very quickly, and I'm wrapping up, literally, uh, Professor Lacroix, please bear with me. I've, you're going to give me two more minutes. Uh, neither the Gulf model nor the Gulf segregation model are viable strategies in the long term. Autocrats do not want to economically awaken a mobilized middle class capable of mounting another Arab Spring. So as we talk about bringing most of people outside of informality, at the end of the day, when they look hard, they prefer, they prefer relying on rents to finance this with budget deficits rather than risking uh, bringing or triggering uh, demand for taxation and representation. So this is an inherent contradiction. Uh, structural exclusion, inequality of existing models make future popular appraisings more likely. Not less likely, more likely. Now, when will it come is another issue. We can't predict this. I think we're not anymore in the cycle of uh, biological generations. We're in political generations. It's not my father or my grandfather was in May 68, and then I'll, you know, I'll one day uh, become politically active afterwards. No, my older brother was there, and I've seen him. And my older brother now stayed home, but I'm going to take upon myself that task. So we are, I think, more in the logic of political, uh, political uh, generation. Now, literally the last slide. I see my neighbor in relief. Good. Uh, the status quo has created economic dualism, dividing MENA between cosmopolitan elites and rest, restive, resulting in broad and, and discontent cycles. So I will not, I will go just to the, what is the last side. So what is the solution? Now, the solution is linking political reform with economic reform, making them overlap. 
And uh, uh, the story here is, is that these are not structural problems. They are structural to authoritarian regimes and autocracy, but they are not structural to the contract. Even in Egypt, in the big mess it is, it can have a solution out. It will be difficult, but it can have a solution out. And the best uh, example for this is Brazil. A transition, a, a political transition towards democracy uh, has brought about you know, a, a, a real, sustained, and a strong economy, an economy that has been able uh, to be among the top 10 global economies in the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Democracy is not a panacea. It's not a panacea for this. It is a sine qua non condition. It is the necessary condition, but not, but not a sufficient condition, which is different. Only with real and genuine pluralism will you have accountability, will you have the possibility uh, for rotations in power, for people to bring about their ideas of management to the forefront, it's only with genuine pluralism that everybody's going to feel he has a stake in the system and it's going to release uh, uh, positive energies uh, to bring about uh, positive economic change. It's also with genuine pluralism that you give mandate continuously to more and more uh, uh, competent elites to run uh, your bureaucracy and that these bureaucracies do not become fiefdoms. Now, of course, there are problems with democracies. Democracies, when they come about, are messy. Messy because people have extraordinary demands in periods of freedom, and because at the same time, productivity goes down, and output comes down. So you have the juxtaposition of the two. And then as democracy starts to take root, you have elites with see, with see uh, their places in power as ways to subsidize their continued staying in power. And that's the story of Tunisia. And this is why uh, it regressed. So it's not sufficient, but it's a necessary condition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alawi, for this uh, engaged, uh, erudite, stimulating uh, presentation. And now uh, the floor is to uh, Professor Diwan. Thank you. Now, Professor, it was also now, very Professor Diwan rips me apart. <laughs> No, no, I mean, this was also very intense. You must be very tired uh, intellectually, emotionally. It was so much content. I mean, I, I cannot rip you apart because, uh, uh, I mean, I find it so refreshing to hear about the Middle East in, in, in this different way. And this is really, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Ali, you, you represent in many ways the, 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 the new school, the new way of looking at the Middle East that combines uh, economics, politics, sociology that's based on analysis, on, on figures, as opposed to simplistic ways. I mean, it's, it's so refreshing not to hear the word Islam or Islamism once <laughs> through the whole presentation, frankly. Uh, and so we're, we're finding ways of getting much closer to the real tensions that are, that are there in the ground and understanding is really the beginning of, of, of finding solutions. Of, and in, in many ways, it also represents the, 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 the etadam of people in the region. I mean, you know, the revolutions may not have succeeded, but people are much more connected. Uh, they, they have uh, failures bring uh, new expectations, uh, a new, uh, new will to change things. So we actually do have a region in transformation, and we see it through, through these slides, uh, on the march to, to hopefully some, something better. Um, and, and this kind of new analysis, you know, uses words such as, uh, or concepts, so, you know, chronism uh, in terms of state business relations, uh, clientelism, repression, uh, dual, dual economies, uh, uh, you know, social mobility, uh, grievances. So it's a new concept that, that combined to, to, to understand this region differently and, and differentially. We, we, we see three regions, not one region. We have the rich, we have the, the middle income, we have the falling, the failing state, which are middle income, sometimes middle oil that, that are falling. Uh, and we have the drama of, of, of Gaza every morning to remind us of how hard it is to, to fall. Um, but uh, 
So let me just say, make three points uh, to take us to today, to the tensions to, uh, of, of, of today. Um, I, mean, I think the central point you make is that politics at, is, is at the center, and, and, and autocrats are at the center, and, and they lead in a way. And it's, it's uh, their attempt at survival that defines what we get on, on the economy. So uh, we, we have, on the one hand, young princes uh, that used to be uh, in, a, in a comfortable rentier environment where with carrots you could, you could actually rule, uh, but they have a big challenge now. We see the end of oil, end of oil in 2050 if everything goes well, and so they have to diversify their economy, which is a huge transformation. So you talk of this new social contract that's needed. That's one, uh, rising GCC, but uh, you know, still with challenges. Uh, and then you have the other countries, the middle income countries that are moving to, to, to the periphery where uh, autocrats are very fragile now. Uh, they're, they're even going through the end of a cycle, uh, a cycle that started with, with the uprising. We have financial crisis. Uh, threatening everywhere, and, and so how would they survive? So let, let me take each one for two minutes and then have a thought about the, 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 the road to democracy and, and, and the, the difficulty. So as we look at, at the GCC challenge, and this is something you will be looking at for the next few years, uh, you, you have outlined the, the social challenge. I mean, the, the new social contract will have basically a Saudi, because really it's this Saudi Arabia is the real, uh, the big bet here. The, the bet is to move to a social contract where instead of like your parents, you have your father in the administration, you know, you study, you go into the administration, you are upper middle class, you live comfortably. Now the young people cannot work there, they have to work in the private sector. One income is not enough, the wife has to work as well. So it's harder, you, you pay taxes, uh, goods are not subsidized, but you can go to the movies in the evening. You can even dance if you like. So uh, there is much more social freedom, but there is no political freedom. So will this social contract hold? That's the big bet. But that's not the only bet. This bet is embedded in another bet, which is the economic bet. Can they transform an economy based on just extracting oil to a diversified economy that produces and exports things, goods and services, a uh, big challenge, I mean, that you would need to have a bourgeoisie perhaps, or what? Uh, maybe they're trying to create state capitalism a la China. We don't know. The model is being shaped. I mean, if you have a bourgeoisie, then you have a state business relation. This is a new class. How would this new class relate to, to, to power? Uh, you may have followed the event of the Ritz-Carlton, where the richest people were literally put in jail because central power cannot accommodate easily to, 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 to other more autonomous. So, so the second bet is to actually manage politically and economically to have a diversified economy. And that's a huge bet uh, that, that, that we follow closely with uh, huge investments, whether it's Neon or other things, are these white elephants, are these good investments? But this is, this is a third bet, which is the geopolitical bet. I mean, uh, over time, you're selling oil to China, you're getting your weapons from, from, the, from, from, from the US, so you have to, 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 to balance those relationships and try to sell oil all the way to 2050. Be the marginal producer, that's the bet. To maximize revenues, to use these trillions to diversify the economy. So there's a new geopolitical role, very crucial, uh, you know, you, 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 you have to be a good citizen in the world, which probably means over time to be the guardian of the region and, and uh, avoid failing states and all kinds of new responsibilities that will have to come. So, so it's a huge bet. Uh, the princes are young and, and ambitious and would only be 60 or 70 in 2050, uh, but they have a huge bet and they have trillions of dollars to, to achieve these bets. So it's going to be very interesting to watch. Now, a few words. Uh, Will we be allowed to watch? We may, well, 2050 is not so far. Okay. If you keep jogging and saying in good shape, yeah. inshallah. I need a hearing aid now, but I'm okay. Well, we can get that. <laughs>
So moving quickly to the middle income, to, to you know, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Jordan, Morocco, uh, the situation there is actually interesting, and, and, and the way you describe it is really interesting. I mean, these are not regimes, they are regimes interested in survival and not in maximizing the size of the economy. Actually, they'd rather have a big share of a small pie. A big pie is threatening. It gets all kinds of new forces that threaten them. And, and you know, you, you give two beautiful examples. One is cronism. You know, they, they'd like to control the private sector. And private investment is shrinking in all these countries, in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, in, in Jordan. It's very small. Uh, they're not comfortable with the private sector that they don't dominate. That's one example. The other example you give is education. And we've worked together on a book that you've edited on education. Education is indoctrination. It is not to help you uh, analyze and, and have critical mind and innovate. It's, so all this you know, shrinks the pie uh, for regime survival. Now, these regimes right now are, are in trouble because uh, after the Arab Spring, they've spent a lot, uh, they borrowed, uh, and, and uh, you know, there was very cheap capital then. But now we are in a phase of uh, higher interest rate, global fight about, against inflation, shocks with the Ukraine war, more expensive uh, import of fuel and, uh, and food, and tourism is down because of, uh, of Gaza and other things. And so this, the, the, the macro situation is, is, is very difficult. Uh, and it's going to blow up. Lebanon blew up. Uh, two weeks ago, Egypt was, about, was blowing up. Uh, Tunisia is, in the, in, is blowing up. And frankly, Jordan is not very far. Uh, now, now there was a lot of easy money, and easy money generates low pressure to reform. And easy money is, 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 comes to help the autocrats stay in power because you know, foreign powers are very comfortable with these autocrats. They defend against uh, radicalism and Islamism, and the region stays friendly to Israel, and uh, they now are policemen not letting refugees come to Europe. They play. The, the, the game of, uh, of, uh, of, of Europe and the United States. Uh, and, and, and now what we see in Egypt is a big bailout. Normally, you know, there's a big financial crisis. This cleans up the political system. We've seen that, say, in Turkey in 2000. You get, the, it's a failure of the political system. You get the political renewal. Uh, just a week ago or so, right? A big bailout package was announced by the UAE, the Emirates for, uh, for Egypt, $35 billion to buy, to buy 20 kilometers of pristine beach. Uh, and then the European Union followed up with $8 billion, and then the IMF added $5 billion. So, you know, Egypt just got $50 billion, and that would be good enough for the very unproductive economy to live for another two to three years, and then we'll see. Yeah. Right? Uh, interestingly, we are not seeing that uh, mobilization for Tunisia. So maybe Tunisia will go through a creative crisis and uh, uh, democracy will be back on the march there. So this is the situation in, in, in the lower, in, in the middle income country. A last word on, on democracy, which is inspired by what you said. You, you said, I mean, I, I think, aspiring bourgeoisie and restive masses lead to cyclical revolutions. I found that quite inspiring. I mean, it reminded me of the autocratic uh, paradox uh, uh, the, uh, of Tocqueville, you know, Tocqueville says that la petite vient en mangeant, you know, as, as, as you're democratizing, uh, the pressure to democratize becomes, becomes faster because, uh, you know, the more freedom you see, the more you want, actually. And this doesn't seem to be working so far in the Middle East. And it seems to me it's because of uh, aspiring bourgeoisie and restive masses division, you know, the dualism that you're talking about. So in a way, we have an autocratic paradox as opposed to a democratic paradox. So when, basically, when the economy is good, the, the young, middle class, educated young aspire for more. That's what we saw with, with, with the Arab Spring. But the masses are content because the economies are doing okay. They don't really mobilize. And so the revolution doesn't go all the way. And then when things are bad, the masses are unhappy. You know, there's not enough clientelism, not enough uh, uh, les gueux sort of rebel. But then the bourgeoisie 
gets frightened and goes back under the protection of the autocrat. Basically, that's what we see. Uh, 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 this is what, what you've called the cyclical revolutions, right? So there is a revolution, and then the, the revolutionaries uh, like call for Sisi to come and save them from, uh, from, from the street. And so, you know, the, the key question I ask you is, is how, we're gonna, how, how is the region going to manage to go beyond this, this dualism and, and kind of unite, if you like, the forces for change? Thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Diwan. Um, for this very rich discussion. Um, uh, Dr. Ala, we, do you want to respond in two minutes because we'd really like to open okay. the, the floor to the, to the Q&A. So if there's any yes. comment you want to make. Well, up until now, the, 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 these regimes have been able to to survive or to manage their their autocracies by putting in place, uh, you know, hybrid regimes, essentially opening up just enough, uh, but not not allowing, uh, but still controlling the, the controlling the, uh, the the playing field, so that they have always the advantage for incumbents, uh, playing just enough, uh, also while being also hegemonic, because most of the key sectors were kept out of grasp or grasp from the opposition. A second and very important uh, tool that they used additionally to, uh, in addition to be able to absorb and deflect change was uh, using the Islamists as the boogeyman. The presence of Islamists in uh, these uh, limited races uh, helped them basically threaten the middle class and saying, look, you will have radicals that are going to come and confiscate your rights, and threatening the West also with that into supporting them. So that was the big cushion was the Islamist movements. These Islamist movements cannot and will not satisfy that role anymore in the same way. So that, that alibi, they're being deprived from that alibi. Doesn't mean Islamism will end, no. On the contrary, it will have to exist, but in a reformulated way. So. The next time around, I, I, I don't see those, uh, those hybrid games played in the same way. And this is where the breakthrough can happen. Uh, again, uh, you, the, the, the challenge will have to be, again, uh, mounted one more time. And before, you'd have to wait for that new political generation to come online. Now people are traumatized. People are demoralized, broken spirits are much more difficult to mend than broken bones. And that's what's happened also. And at the same time, there's a lull. But that lull uh, is temporary. Let's see how things will be put in place again. But the autocratic regime has less assets this time around than next time around, I think. Thank you. You see, Professor Diwan, we had to say something about Islamism in the end. To kind of came back to the discussion somehow. Uh, came back positively. Positively, yes. Divide and rule will not work anymore. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you to, uh, to both speakers. Um, th there's something you told me, uh, uh, Dr. Alawi, that I should mention and that I didn't. Uh, this will be part of uh, research you're publishing in La Revue Pouvoir, right? That's correct. This is uh, so an ongoing research which, uh, we'll which will be, I hope, will be published uh, in Pouvoir in, in an upcoming number. Right. So, so, so watch out for Pouvoir if you want to have a... Uh, the, the, you know, the, the eventual um, result of the, this ongoing research. Uh, and now we can open the q and I guess you have many questions. Uh, we have two mics on each side. And from what I understand, you have to queue behind the mics. Is that the way? So depending on which side of the room you're, uh, you can just stand up and go to the mic. Um, so if you're on the left, you have a mic on the left. If you're on the right, you have a mic on the right. Yes. You Is it working? Want to start? Oh. Yeah, it seems to be working. Nice. Please. I have a lot of questions, but I'm not going to ask all of them. <laughs> uh, the main question I have is about your, um, uh, your solution, the road to democracy solution. So um, you s 
just said that the autocratic regimes can do not have a lot in in their possess to keep using and keep surviving. But um, let's look at the case of Iran recently and what happened with the women life freedom movement. The scale of oppression was so extensive that it is discouraging kind of to keep mobilizing like that. It was one of the few moments post-1979 revolution that both the these two segments of the society got out and start <laughs> demanding some things. And more democracy and at the same time economy. So Iran is a good case of this combination of economic suppression and democratic suppression. But this is a discouraging moment for this country. And I, I believe it can be said that it can happen in any other countries in the Middle East and in the Arab world. So how do you respond to that? Thank you. We'll, we'll take maybe two, three questions so that you can, so maybe on that side. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, my question goes into a bit of a different direction, but basically um, I was wondering about the role of the, for example, the UN and other international actors in the development of the Middle East, because basically what you were saying is that most or a lot of the autocratic regimes don't even have a necessarily interest in bringing up the middle class to a more very economically developed uh, status and have an interest in this dualism. So basically I was wondering how does this, for example, from, from the UN efforts of development in that region, how does that fit into that? Is there even, basically, is there even a point of having these development efforts without political change in the first place? Thank you very much. And maybe one last. And uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you, Sciences Po. Uh, my question is uh, a broad question. Uh, it's very likely that Trump will be president again, though I don't want it to be so. Um, and um, with all due respect, uh, the first place he went to was uh, Saudi, and uh, recently since the massacre of the people of Palestine, uh, there was some uh, throwing around this question of, oh, maybe we should make a deal and uh, give Saudi some nuclear opportunities. Uh, that's one thing. And so, um, I don't know how much we can stop Trump. I spent eight years at the UN. Nobody was really willing to try to stop him. Uh, and so uh, the development question, the whole world is working on the development, sustainable development. And anyway, I'll just throw that in there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to, do you want to take a yes. one? Or? Oh, yeah, I can. I, you want yeah, me to you take can take those. Probably you can take those, and then we'll, uh, we'll yes. have a second and a third round, so. Yes. Uh, very quickly, the, sto the, st the story of Iran is not is not yet uh, finished, though. It's uh, it's yes, there's a cycle and a cycle of violence and repression, but this is the third cycle that is, has happened. Some uh, people tend to think that the uh, that the Islamic Revolution is just uh, knowing a crisis and that it can, if somehow uh, can be, if it opens up a little bit, it can accommodate for this. I think the Islamic Revolution is knowing an existential crisis. And the repression, I'll grant you, is very, very powerful and very strong. But the vitality of society is no less stronger. I've never seen a society in the region and anywhere else that has this strength to resist. It's absolutely inspiring and unbelievable. So this cycle is not finished. The regime has the upper hand now, but nobody can say where things will go. And nobody said, that an autocratic regime will give itself, uh, will, will give up power easily. Yes, the Mubarak regime has, give, has given up uh, power easily, but the, 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 the Mubarak regime was a, was a geocratic regime of completely, completely uh, rotted elites that have been known in full decay and going adrift. This is not the same case of this regime that has huge resources. And let's not forget, it may be a theocracy, but to what degree is it a military dictatorship too, given that the, the army of the Pastoran are behind the power? So this is an equation we have to look at more deeply, knowing that these things come 
and with a struggle. Now, the other question on the UN, will the UN and will more general multilateral efforts uh, help democracy or, or encourage democracy in the region? I think that uh, the democracy promotion business has taken a very bad rep in the world and especially in our area. How can we talk about democracy promotion when rule of law and international law is so blatantly violated by Israel that has a, that has a seat on the UN with the acquiescence of the entire Western community? Now, given that reality, <laughs> given, given that despicable behavior, how can the, the citadels of democracy promote democracy in our region? Very dubious, I am not at all hopeful. Now, and better off, in fact, the democracy promotion of Mr. Bush in Iraq has, if anything, thwarted and dampened democracy. It had basically to take him leaving office for the Arab Spring to come. It would have never happened, even with his eloquent and, and strident and flamboyant speeches of him or, 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 or Condoleezza Rice in, in Cairo, it didn't take because people knew what this was about. It was self-serving and interest-driven. And lastly, about Trump. Trump might win, he might, he might lose, but please keep in mind that Trump, Trump is not the cause, but is a result of something. His populism is thriving elsewhere. It's thriving in Hungary. It's thriving, it was thriving in Brazil. It's thriving with the Modi government in India. And it's there because the liberal model of democracy has failed for a variety of historical reasons because it hasn't delivered out of people. And the, 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 the blatant or the most telling episode was the 2008 uh, uh, crisis in Wall Street and the economic meltdown. Who ended up paying the bill? It was not the, ba the bank and the fat cats of Wall Street. It was, the, it was the ordinary taxpayer in the United States. That's the reason for the real populism in the United States. So Trump is a result. is not a cause. But that populism, too, will come to an end because it can't deliver. It's not the real thing. How long will it take? Who knows? Thank you. Do you want to say something? Okay. okay, so we'll take some more questions. Um, Yes. Uh, thank you for your lecture. My question, my first question is about Egypt. Do you think that if the interests and actions of Sisi and the military regime continue to not be aligned with the interests of the people and the capital is physically moved away from the people, the economic situation continues to deteriorate, would that make another revolution inevitable? And on another note, some of these countries have very large diasporas. Do you think they have any role in building democratic foundations and institutions in their countries of origin? Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes. I'm yeah. interested in hearing both of our guests answer to this. Um, how do you define U.S. interest in the Middle East? Uh, not historically, but today. Is it oil, defending Israel? democracy. I'm very interested in hearing your answers. Thanks. Bonsoir, je vais poser ma question en français, désolé. Euh, je voulais vous poser une question par rapport au concept d'accountability dont vous avez parlé. Est-ce que vous pensez avec une élite pour le cas du Maroc qui est industrieuse mais qui et en quelque sorte se base sur une économie de rente parce que les entreprises ils vont rester dans cette zone grise et même dans le reste de la population il va avoir cette sensibilité à ne pas forcément rentrer dans enfin ne pas avoir euh, ne pas payer tous ses impôts est-ce que vous pensez que c'est euh, par rapport au fait que l'état ne garantit pas les services euh, minimum qui pourraient laisser les personnes euh, on va dire rentrer dans un système d'une zone verte au lieu d'une zone grise merci Merci beaucoup. Um, do you want to? Yes, I'll, I'll take correct. Yeah, concerning uh, concerning Egypt, uh, 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 my colleague uh, Ishaq Diwan has basically uh, put the framework down. If the regime has two years bailout, has an oxygen of two years, and it was given a shot in the arm, not for nothing, it was given a shot on the arm as part of this counter-revolutionary effort to placate 
what Gulf actors, certain Gulf actors perceive as threat, these, these, these nations or these Gulf nations do not act like this because they're villains. They act like this because they perceive this as a, as a threat. And they have also doubled, they have also exposed themselves on the, on the, on the, uh, on the side of this regime beforehand. They can't risk losing now as the, as the pushback may be even more costly. So how long will the bailout go on? Uh, uh, that's something that we're going to have to figure out. Plus, this bailout, as uh, Professor Diwan said, it's, 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 it's charades in multilateral effort because the IMF is, be, is, be, is part of the package. But the IMF is a decision from Washington. It's a decision from the West. It's not a decision from the board or whatever. Ultimately, it's a decision from Washington. And so the Gulf is hiding behind Washington. And Washington is hiding behind the Gulf with the idea that, look, we don't need an extra mess in the region now. But ultimately, there are no other solutions. Plus something else about the, of the Egyptian regime. The Egyptian regime uh, can be and will become very violent. It will become very violent because Sisi's project has elements of Italian fascism, you know, there. This, it's about, it's not about transforming the individual as a prototype totalitarian regime was, but it comes very close to that. It's very clump, comes very close to that. And at the end of the day, my sense is that if push comes to shove, then the military will basically push uh, CC aside and bring somebody else. And CC knows that the threat comes from the armed forces, comes from his military. Now, one last thing about uh, US interest. US interest in the region, it's not about democracy. I don't think it's about democracy promotion. Yes, there are some people in power that can be very decent and principled, like Jimmy Carter, even like Obama. But at the end of the day, it's about geopolitical interests. And the geopolitical interests are the cause for Obama to have abandoned Mubarak. It's not the normative, uh, the normative uh, given. Oil. It's important for the United States to control not to get oil at stable or at uh, advantageous prices, because it has access to other oils and other reservoirs and other supplies of oil that have come online. But it's important geopolitically to control the faucet, because the faucet means whether China or Russia or other threatening countries that are, uh, that are uh, challengers will get it at advantageous price. So it, it's, a, it's an idea of controlling fluxes. That's the most important uh, uh, part in the, in, the, in, the, in the equation for the United States. Now, it also has a big problem. It can't break the addiction it has to supporting the intransigence of Israel. We're not talking about the security of Israel. I think this, the security of Israel or the right of Israel to exist is something that's more or less you know, acquired and almost has been, has been guaranteed for Israel. It's the intransigence of Israel, that it can do whatever it wants to do, that it can starve a whole population in Gaza, that it can bomb people indefinitely, commit uh, human, human crimes, commit war crimes. I'm not saying necessarily genocide, because genocide is something that has to be proven in a court of law, and you have to prove uh, intentionality. So these are important laws and important principles that we have to respect. But um, it's giving a blank check for Israel to do whatever it wants in Gaza. And that's a real thing that is tying uh, the, the, American, uh, uh, the American hands. And at the same time, it's also creating a problem for the re-election of, of, of Biden, as you know, because for many people, this is a human rights issue. This is about the United States losing its humanity. So yes, for the first time, the uh, United States is in a bind about Gaza. But because precisely what's happening in Gaza, it will not, at this particular conjuncture, want to destabilize, I think, uh, uh, to, divide, uh, to destabilize Egypt, unless, of course, something dramatic happens. Now, the final question about ac accountability for elites in Morocco. Vous avez moins posé la question en français, je vous réponds en français. Quand je parlais d'accountability, je ne parlais pas d'accountability pour les acteurs économiques. 
C'est vrai que les acteurs économiques, pour des acteurs économiques, l'autonomie est importante. Et accountability est une partie de l'autonomie. Non, mais je parlais de la citoyenneté de manière générale. Un nouveau contrat qui nous permettrait d'aller vers une monarchie parlementaire. C'est de ça que je parlais. Si tout le monde, if there is an accountability, une séparation de pouvoir là, le citoyen lambda peut se trouver à ce moment-là encouragé à être un acteur plus actif dans, dans l'économie et, et, et accepter les aléas d'une économie. Descend, ça monte, et ne pas seulement euh, accuser automatiquement le régime, mais de se dire qu'en définitive, qu'on aura la possibilité à de nouvelles élections, à donner un mandat à une nouvelle force politique qui viendra implémenter ce gouvernement. C'est dans ce sens que je, je voulais dire. Quoique, dans une économie plus grande et plus importante dans laquelle les élites joueront un, un rôle plus important. Cette question de la comptabilité joue parce qu'elle donne aux acteurs économiques un embedded autonomy. J'utilise le mot embedded parce que c'est un concept qui a été élaboré par euh, Peter Evans, je pense. Et c'est dans ce sens que je l'utilise aussi. Merci beaucoup. Euh, quelques mots Oui, deux petits mots rapides. Uh, déjà, merci. Thank you for uh, speaking so well about Gaza, this is also refreshing. In Paris, we, we don't hear honest uh, uh, opinions sufficiently, I think, so this is, this is really refreshing. But uh, just to finish on, on your rents, I think rents are really important. And uh, to answer on Iran, I mean, uh, in, in, in my book, uh, which I think you should uh, read, it's called The Political Economy of the Middle East, uh, with Melanie Kamet, we have one other category, which is middle, inc middle oil countries. These are the most dangerous and the hardest to change. You know, Iran, Iraq, uh, 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 Algeria. These are countries that don't have enough oil to distribute to everyone, but they have plenty of oil to finance a very tight security system and a closed circle, which is very hard to displace. For the other countries, uh, and to come to the question on Egypt and on the UN, which I imagine is also about the World Bank and you know, external donors, can they, you know, I don't think you can change a regime from the outside. It really has to come from the inside. Uh, and and uh, we, we really had a, we, 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 we had a consultation with civil society group recently uh, about ways of changing. And, and you know, interestingly, Right now, civil society groups don't believe in revolutions anymore. They think that change has to come gradually, that they have a role to play, to, to, to come up with, with, with visions, with innovations, being bridges to, 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 to new developments that would create momentum for change, uh, that they have to find new ways to, 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 change, to change gradually from, from within. So. Um, so, so that, that's, that's a different way, I think. Uh, so, so for example, civil society has an important role in monitoring uh, disbursements by the World Bank, by the UN, and, 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 and saying this is not good, you know, we don't want to bail out, uh, you have to, 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 to put conditions on this and that, and these institutions would, would listen to them. Thank you so much. I'm glad uh, Professor Diwan could speak about his book, which is the reference book on the political economies of the Middle East, and I think an important reference for many of you who are interested in the, in the subject, so that's good that we had a chance to, uh, to mention it. Um, we'll take the last questions. We have one, two, three, four, five, right? And we'll stop there, but we'll take these five questions, and then you know, the challenge will be for uh, Dr. Alawi and Professor Diwan to, you know, give a short response to these questions. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. I would like to thank Sciences Po for organizing this event. Dr. Ali, we thank you for, for coming and taking the, the, the road from the, from the US. I would like to pick your brain for, on something. When I have discussions with my, with my fellow Moroccans, we always discuss about political, and you have elucidly, elucidated that uh, economy and politics are inextricably linked. And one of the discussions, their argument they say is that we are, as, 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 as long as the economy is rolling, we don't need as much democracy. And they're talking about enlightened despotism. And, and I think you have written and researched about despotism éclairé so much. So I would love to, to, to pick your brain on this and have your arguments about how we can democratize and still push economy for, for everyone and being able to, to follow the democracy 
in, 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 the, in these states with the economic progress and development because they seem for some people to be quite different. So as long as we have an economic uh, progress, we don't care if we have liberty and freedom, things that I, we judge uh, necessary for any uh, human emancipation. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question about um, the social inequalities in the MENA region. So there is one important reason that uh, I think may explain these social inequalities and that um, we don't often hear is the spoken language in the country, which is uh, the consequence of abandoned public institutions such as uh, education. Indeed, we can see this in different countries like uh, Morocco, of course, Algeria, Tunisia, or Lebanon. And my question is that will the elite class one, one day uh, accept to put their uh, children in a public school where they will uh, mainly study in Arabic and not in French or in English in order to promote social diversity and allow a son of a worker to be best friend with the son of a CEO, a CEO sorry, of a big company? Indeed, uh, will this elite class will be able to let aside their um, all their uh, advantages and uh, like accept uh, this uh, this challenge? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bonsoir. Excuse me, je ne parle pas français. That's why I was speaking English. Um, I have a question to both of you, um, especially to the external contradictions uh, that were mentioned that um, economy or economics development at home enables aggressive interventionist abroad and so instability and also to the uh, economic bet to deal with other states and uh, diversification. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the DP World projects in the Gulf of Eden and the Red Sea, but they have caused some frictions in and around Djibouti. And my question is, what's the UAE's and the Gulf states goal in the region around Djibouti and in Djibouti? and how to deal with the competitors like China. It's a little bit specific, but I hope you can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and let's, let's try to be quick for the last questions. Yeah, please. good evening. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, my question is regarding the project the dualist economies have for the masses, because I thought it was interesting how- Could you speak just a little louder? Remember, yeah, I'm going I, deaf. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how you said that in dualist economies, uh, the government let certain uh, privileges, privileges to a certain part of society so that it can lift the others. Whereas, like, since the model is separating these two, like, masses and then privileged classes, like, how, I don't see how, um, like, the idea of lifting the masses. Can you expand more on this? Thank you. Thank you. And then the last question. Alors euh, bonjour, je ne vais pas me risquer à poser une question en anglais et en peur de mon accent. Alors vous nous avez parlé à plusieurs fois d'un volet social, notamment d'une recomposition sociale. Je me demandais euh, de quelle manière la question du changement climatique va influencer le changement euh, sociétal. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Yes, the floor is yours for the last yes. set of responses. Yes. Uh, let 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 me begin with uh, with the, yeah let me begin like the one with the, with with democracy and um, and economic performance from my countrymen uh, from my Moroccan countrymen uh, the, the, the 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 question when you pose Morocco when you pose the question to Moroccans it's not so much about economic development and uh, and democracy because. Uh, 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 that economic development for them in their mind is, is, a, is a kind of a given. The real question that they're, that they're reacting to, it's about order and disorder. If we're gonna go down the, the democratic uh, route, and we've seen that during the Arab Spring, that poses the question of instability. It poses the question of, of the instability threatening our, uh, our economic growth, and so, posed in that question, yes, most people, unless they understand the linkages very intimately, prefer the guarantee of a smooth economic development rather than instability for which it has not been demonstrated that it's gonna deliver. 
Remember, the Arab Spring is a question, is perhaps the only region in which the drivers of political change is seen as observers. They have not transitioned into political parties that would lead that change. That's one of the reasons why the Arab Spring failed, is because all these youths stayed outside and watched observers, and they started looking as, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 as, a, uh, as, a, as a supervisor and an observer to all these parties that already are part of the you know, of the, of the establishment and of the system. So of course, Moroccans are gonna, are, gonna, are gonna react that way. And of course, most are gonna react, Jordanians are gonna react that, except for the Tunisian, which have taken the path. Now, there is an illusion here. And this is an illusion which everybody is, is succumbing to. And even regimes are succumbing to. It's not necessarily a cynical, you know, Machiavellic view, no. It's an illusion that, look, there is, we can tweak this thing so that we can, you know, uh, resemble these East Asian tigers. And before the East Asian tigers, it was just the success of Tunisia or maybe Dubai. The problem is they will never replicate the East Asian tiger because the East Asian tiger, it was a question of embedded autonomy, which these firms do not have in their respective economic, uh, in their respective economic settings, the region in, in East Asia was cordoned off to war and instability by the United States, and huge money was pumped into into these uh, into these economies, and they had countervailing powers of checks and balances, which had to do precisely with strong communist movements inside these countries. Whether, whether Indonesia, whether Korea, or so forth. And hence, those systems provided checks and balances and a kind of accountability. It's not that the, the Koreans, South Koreans, were less prone to cronyism than Moroccans or Tunisians. No, it's that they had a, a certain uh, conjuncture, a kernel of economic and socioeconomic uh, 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 givens and, and parameters which had made them different. The fact that they were cordoned off geopolitically, the fact that they had these countervailing efforts, the fact that a lot of money has been, uh, a lot of resources have been pumped in precisely into these countries for them to be a showpiece against Maoism, against uh, 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 you know, Marxism, Leninism, that they've succeeded. And also, without falling into this um, essentializing culture, there is a, let's historicize it in a certain moment in time, Meritocracy was very important in this region, more so than in uh, the rest of the world. Let's not essentialize this. And for all these variety of reasons, the role of Japan also, because of all sorts of the reason, you had embedded auton autonomy to these firms. They could succeed. Let me end on that question just to, to, to tell you that there are two examples in our region of embedded autonomy. Aramco is an example of embedded autonomy. Embedded, uh, Aramco is a success story worldwide because the Saudi regime at that time did not have the means to run the petroleum sector and it had its hands off and Aramco became a success story. Even today, Aramco has patents in the field of, of plastics and, and, and petroleum engineering which do not exist in the West. Another success story of embedded, democ of embedded uh, autonomy is uh, the Arab Bank in Jordan. The Jordanian regime had to lay off, because it was a Palestinian entity, and it catered to Palestinian refugees, that it was a success story. So that reinforces my point. Lastly, but, but, but uh, I want to come to this issue of education. You know whether uh, uh, a more egalitarian education system uh, can work. The problem is, is even those that are, find themselves in an economic precarious situation will starve themselves to death, literally, to have their children go into, the public, into a private school. To show you that no one will sacrifice the future of his children for some you know, principled and very uh, noble goal it is that would help beneficially outcome. But you have, a, uh, you have literally a, uh, a uh, 
collective action problem which is unsurmountable because it's highly emo emotional. And lastly, uh, I don't know who talked about de -global, uh, globalization at one point. The point is we are in a situation of deglobalization after 2008 crisis. And after all these crises, the, the city, the, the state is back at the center of the equation. And there's a lot of deglobalization that is happening precisely due to the shortening of these supply chains uh, on the economic field since uh, COVID and since uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, war. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We need to finish because we have to leave the room. So join me in thanking uh, Dr. Alawi and Professor Diwan for a wonderful exchange. And have a great evening. And yes. Stephanie. And Stefan, yeah, well, I cannot thank myself, but I thank Stephanie as well, uh, who uh, has left. And, uh, and all of you, thank you. Thank you very much.